Since you guys love the first two headcanon videos so much, we're back with a third one. And you guys flooded the comments with your headcanons. I usually read every single headcanon, but this time, I literally just couldn't. There was too many. This is my most requested video, and the headcanons just kept getting better and better. I am so ready for this. Again, time for my super cool brief explanation. What is a headcanon? A headcanon is a piece of fan canon that you come up with in your head. It doesn't have to be true. It doesn't have to make sense. It can be whatever you want. It could be something like, this character looks funny. They probably drink smoothies on Thursday and hate them. Some of you put way more thought into it than that, but you get the idea. Anyways, let's dive back into these headcanons for a part 3. Airy Fire says, My headcanon is that the reason some nicknames are censored in future Pokemon games is because the trainer is just realizing how embarrassing it would be to have those names called out in public. This one is actually really funny to me. It's like they had a moment of self-awareness, like, huh. Maybe I shouldn't name my Pokemon Shithid. It still doesn't stop them from calling their Pokemon things like Table, though. That should just be considered Pokemon abuse. This guy says, My headcanon is that Ash isn't actually as dense as he seems. He actually gets what romance is and having romantic feelings and understands, but he probably hides it because he enjoys messing with his friends. Also, seeing Brock strike out with literally any girl has probably taught him not to be so forward with his feelings. Ash actually understanding a romance would be the biggest fuck you to Serena ever, and it would be hilarious. There's been so many times she's shown interest in him, and if he just did it for the bit, that'd both be really mean but really funny. Also, the thought of him witnessing all of Brock's failures and being horrified is also pretty fun. Choco Donut says, I have a few headcanons. The reason Pokemon seem to tolerate pain of Mega Evolution is because of how much they trust their trainer. Blue's favorite food is Hershey's chocolate. Don't ask. Pokemon tolerating the pain of Mega Evolution because of their trust honestly makes a ton of sense. I always thought it was weird that the transformation only possible through a perfect bond with your Pokemon would inflict so much pain on it, so I like this headcanon. I have no idea why Blue's favorite food would be a Hershey's chocolate bar, but to be fair, they are pretty good. I mean, I can't really talk. When I played Persona 4, Geyser and I came up with this headcanon that Nanako was a Powerade addict, so honestly, I can't even pretend to act surprised. Things just happen. Scooter McPeanut says, Couple small headcanons of mine related to some of the champions. Cynthia's Shellos evolved after getting its head stuck in a jar of rare candies. No particular reason for this one, I just think it's a funny visual. This headcanon is so adorable and I love it. Cynthia walking into her home only to see her Shellos eating an entire jar of rare candies is the best thing ever. It's like catching a kid stealing from a cookie jar. Scooter also says, Lance has three Dragonites because while looking for a Dratini, he ran into three of them who happened to be siblings, and not wanting to separate one from its family, he just decided to keep them all. This one is heartwarming, but a part of me also thinks he saw this as an amazing opportunity to become extremely powerful. The third one is, Stevens, Armaldo, and Cray Dilly knew each other before the extinction event, and became inseparable after being revived. Imagine dying, and then like, a hundred thousand years later, you wake up, and you are on the same team as your best friend from long ago. That's the coolest story ever. They really do go way back. Trigger Cheese says, I have a headcanon of my personal favorite Pokemon, Delphox. They weren't always fire type, but they evolved to gain the fire typing because they were burnt at the stake for witchcraft. They gained the fire type to resist the flames and take control of them. This one is just genuinely so cool but dark at the same time. I feel like the first one that adapted to control fire had the biggest smirk on their face when they realized. Pastel Diamond Studio says, My headcanon is that Volo is at least a little sleep deprived. He seems like the type of person that would just look for ruins or just try to get as much info on Hisui's legends long into the night and not realize how long he's been out for and just say, wait, crap, when did it become night? I also imagine that he started having one of his Pokemon sitting next to him to notify him when it gets dark. Most of the time it's Arcanine because it doesn't sleep unless its trainer does. This one is way too relatable, which is why I like it. I'm chronically sleep deprived and lose track of time pretty easily, so I share this exact same experience. I'll be honest, I don't even know what day it is. I love the fact that in the headcanon, he needs a Pokemon to be his little alarm clock. It's adorable. Small Dorito Child says, One of my headcanons is that due to being so close to the ultimate weapon and getting infected with the radiation, the Kalos Gang, Serena Column, etc., either gain longer lifespans or shorter lifespans depending on which version you play. This is such a dark yet cool headcanon and I'm all for it. The longer lifespan because of Xerneas is so wholesome and sweet. They get to spend more time with each other, but the shorter lifespan with Eveltal is so grim and eerie. They're all gonna die together at a young age, so uh, yeah, thanks guys. Grimjo Lover says, I have a random little headcanon of four. Part of the reason Rose sponsored Leon was because Leon reminded him of not only himself, 
but Peony. And Rose, wanting that connection again, ends up attempting to replace Peony with Leon. Intentionally or not, I'm thinking of turning this into a post series, but I think it's a fun slash interesting thought. This one is actually really sweet yet somber. It makes me want to feel bad for Rose, but at the same time, that guy's an impatient little brat, so he can go burn in a Volbeat fire. I do feel bad for Peony though. Poor guy. Grimjo also adds, Ryan raised Gumi because he loves them and will gift his gym trainers with one before they leave. He also always carries one with him and his Gudra is a total helicopter parent. This one is hilarious. I love the fact that he just hands these out. Here, take a complimentary Gumi. Him always having one on him is adorable. They can hide in his little hat or something. The last one Grim has is, Leon and Cynthia are actually good friends and Leon will visit her when he visits Sinnoh. Cynthia also knows the best ice cream parlors and Leon definitely got lost in the distortion world at least once. We have a semi-continuation of Cynthia's ice cream addiction. The part that I really like is Leon getting lost in the distortion world. I can just imagine it already. He'd be scared out of his fucking mind floating around while Cynthia has to go drag him out of whatever black hole he's getting sucked into. Andrew's doctor says, Elisa, Nessa, and Tulip have a friendly model rivalry. They have a group chat where Elisa just spams memes. They also commission Valerie for dress designs. I can definitely see all three of them being fashionistas or like a trio of popular girls. I wonder which one's the bitchy leader though. I like the added part where Elisa just spams memes. I feel like they aren't even funny memes. They're just there. Them commissioning Valerie for dress designs is awesome and it just ties everything together. I love it. Andrew also adds, the reason Nimona has her arm brace is because she abused her astralization, causing damage to her tendons, and Bianca's glasses were originally Charon's. The Nimona one was kind of funny until you added the word tendons, and it made it sound really disturbing, though it does kind of remind me of Rock Lee and his gates. The Bianca one is just cute though. Charon mysteriously gets rid of his glasses and Bianca magically gains them, so honestly it's not even that far-fetched. Flamiosaurus says, in contrast to my Cynthia headcanon, I think it's funny to think the least popular protagonists such as Chris or Lucas, who I'm pretty sure are the least popular overall, have secretly plotted on ways to cause the downfall of the more popular protagonist. This gives me vibes for something, and I can't for the life of me remember what it is. I swear, I feel like this trope has been used before, where the unpopular characters all hang out and cope and feel jealous over the main cast. Even if I can't remember what I'm trying to think of, I think it's really funny. Silver of the Rat says, Professor Oak has been keeping Ash from learning about Paldea because he knows for a in fact, Ash would catch 90 more Tauros and he doesn't have any space to keep them all. I also think Ash can tell all the Tauros apart, like Brock can with Nurse Joy. Poor Professor Oak probably has trauma from all those Tauros Ash caught. And the funniest thing about that is I don't think Ash has ever used a single one of them. Ash probably could be able to tell them all apart though, he just seems like the type. The Moa Goddess says, The time machine in Area Zero really works as a time machine, but the Pokemon pulled through it evolve into Paradox Pokemon like a trade evolution, depending on which direction the time machine was set to. I like this explanation way more than the one we currently have, if you can even consider it a reason. I'm still sort of confused on how it all works, but time traveling trade evolutions resulting in paradox Pokemon sounds awesome. You Sinkly says, My headcanon is that all the champions keep in touch with each other and talk about their hobbies. I could really see Steven and Cynthia chatting together because they both have interest in ancient mythologies and remnants of the past like rocks or ruins. Or Lance and Leon because they would talk about their capes, their adventures as champion, and how Charizard isn't a dragon type. Would help the Pokemon world feel more interconnected. I think the idea of a champions only group chat is the funniest thing ever, but also kind of cute in a way. I just wonder what happens if a champion's title gets taken away. Do they all just agree to kick them from the group chat? This is like some Among Us type shit. I can 100% see Steven and Cynthia talking about whatever cool thing they discovered that day, like, oh hey, did you know that our universe is one of many alternate ones, and that each decision we make branches off into a new timeline? Anyways, how's your rock collection going? The Great Lazy Sloth says, I'm very late to the party, but love hearing everyone's creative ideas. Anyways, my headcanon is that Dawn, at least in the anime, always has an item for every occasion, no matter how out of the blue it may be. She's prepared for every possible thing, and her bag is always stuffed full to the brim because of it. I like this one because I honestly feel like she would. No matter how specific the situation is, she has something to help. Need a bottle cap opener? She's got it. Oh, you need a tire pump? Just ask Dawn. What's that? You need the Japanese Pikachu Illustrator card released in 1997, only 39 available in the entire world? Yeah, she's got a few. It's like Maxwell's backpack from Scribblenauts. Never thought I'd be talking about Scribblenauts on this channel, but hey, there's a first time for everything. Mystic Warrior says, Arvin has tried to teach the player how to make sandwiches and fails. This one is so simple, but I love the absurdity of it. How do you fuck up a sandwich? It's like one of the most basic things ever. I feel like Arvin would slowly lose his sanity as the player tries placing it on their head, hand, 
mountains, the ground, literally everywhere except where it's actually supposed to be. Also, Tried implies that this has happened multiple times, so at least he's persistent. Shadow Loves the Game says, My headcanon is that Nimona isn't waiting for us at the gym, but she's actually sitting in some nearby bushes with a spyglass looking at us until we actually get there. I need this one to be true. I love how fucking comical it is. This is something Drake would do and I live for it. Ederko says, Pokemon works on a sort of synergy. Some people work better with Pokemon and others work better with specific types. That's why there's so many type specialists, because some people can train just one type better. It also explains why most people don't have full teams. They can't use some Pokemon as well, at least not as many. On the other side, that makes the champions and more specifically the protagonists prodigies because they can train any and all kinds of Pokemon and do it extremely quickly. Pokemon raising and battling isn't easy, the protagonist is just better at it. This is one of the coolest things I've ever heard. It actually kind of gives a good reason for why some people specialize in specific types. I always thought it was kind of weird. Like, all it takes is one little electric type to ruin an entire flock of birds. It also gives more weight to a title like Pokemon Master or even Champion. Being able to perfect all types of synergies doesn't sound easy. Emperor Wolf says, I love to imagine Pierre's using a million Zigzagoons built up into like a Gundam with an Obstacoon right at the top. I love how in each one of these headcanon videos, people add on more and more into his Zigzagoon obsession. I need to see a Zigzagoon mech now. It sounds hilarious and I love it. That Kalos girl says, My headcanon is that an Ashen Masters would try to befriend all the game versions of his companions, but fail miserably. And Scotty slash Betty would try to tell him that they are different people, but Ash just won't listen. Only being able to befriend Misty and Brock and maybe Iris. This one is so incredibly sad and I never took the time to realize that this is like half true. Imagine seeing a ton of alternate versions of your friends, but they're a lot older and have zero recollection of who you are. On top of the fact that they wouldn't even get along with him, it just makes it even more sad. It's just him and Pikachu and Pasio. I'm sure at least some people would admire his strong willpower though. Ash is a pretty friendly kid too, so I think he'll be fine. Still pretty sad though. Larry LeSimp says, My headcanon is that Professor Turo is afraid of spiders and small bugs. He won't scream, but he'll just uncomfortably stare at the bug. Silly, I know. As simple as this one is, I like it. It's a silly little character quirk that I feel fits him very well. I wonder how long the longest stare down he had with a bug was. Sir Panicalot says, I like the idea that everyone knows that Dynamax Pokemon are terrifyingly dangerous, and when one is sent out during a battle, both trainers have to quickly run off the field prior to its attack. The thought of two people scurrying off like little rats when their Pokemon Dynamaxes is fucking hilarious. It probably does actually happen though, because there's no way that they're safe with literal giants fighting on the battlefield with them. Zagata Saturn says, My headcanon is that Mewtwo has that handle thing so researchers could easily carry him around like a suitcase. This is one of the greatest headcanons I have ever read. I always wondered why Mewtwo had that thing on its neck. It kind of reminds me of the little handle that the GameCube has to let you carry it around. But god, this one's amazing. Please, I need fan art of this. It's it's just so good. I imagine Mewtwo's face is just unamused. Kind of like a cat. M Junior Taurus says, My headcanon is that Giovanni didn't abandon Silver because he didn't care for the kid. He did it because he didn't want to risk his son getting caught in the crossfire of the literal SWAT team raiding the gym, as seen in Generations, or Interpol chasing him down. Making Silver think he was doing it purely for selfish reasons was to ensure he didn't follow. This one honestly makes a lot more sense when you take things from Giovanni's perspective, but also, it's a really convenient excuse for him. Plus, it doesn't help that Silver is also a criminal, so I think Giovanni just likes being a deadbeat. The Space Bat says, I have a headcanon that in Masters, Gloria either couldn't stop swearing or she kept speaking in Scots so no one understood her, so they had to dub over her voice. I love this one. I can just imagine Gloria saying the most outrageous insults only to be poorly dubbed over. Like she's screaming, YOU FUCKING SUCK! GOD DAMN I HATE YOU! DIE! And the dub just says, That was a wonderful battle. I really do hope we meet again soon. Just look at her face. Is that the face of someone who's sane? Cynical Fella says, My headcanon is that in most of the games, you record your first encounter with every new Pokemon. So when you go to the Pokedex and see the Pokemon sprite moving, that's not just an animation, that's the movement the Pokemon did when you discovered it. This one makes everyone's Pokedex a lot more personal. And technically, it sorta is true. It would be really sweet though for trainers to get to relive their first encounter with a Pokemon. Another anonymous alliterator says, On the topic of the anime's insane events, I have a headcanon that the anime is a sort of his friends retelling their journeys with him. That's why Ash has retcons. Because every season is told by a different friend or group. Brock and Misty saw him mature from a newbie trainer trying too hard to be cool, shown by him turning his hat and general overconfidence. May and Dawn saw him as a good friend with more experience than them, leading to their perception of Ash sort of mentoring them in battle. Iris saw him as a kid and over-exaggerates his childlike personality by remembering him as dumber and less capable than he actually is. Serena sees 
use him as a cool, experienced trainer who can do anything, exaggerating his power and skill as a trainer. The Alola crew remembers his talent and skill at battling in food, which is why he becomes more childlike but maintains his battling skills. Go remembers Ash in a first friend perspective while also being astonished at Ash's battling capabilities. I know this one was really long, but it's so good and I really like it. It perfectly explains why Ash seems to have all these sudden changes in demeanor. I wonder what the real Ash is like though, if these are just retellings. As off Dark says, Elisa and Iono have appeared on stream together and have a working brand relationship. The ghost story guy in X and Y is actually just a con man, with the ghost girl mystery in that game being a complete coincidence. I can 100% see Elisa and Iono streaming together, but I also feel like they would fight over the spotlight. As for the ghost story guy, yeah, he doesn't seem that trustworthy. It seems more like a tourist trap than anything actually paranormal. I'm just Nami says, this seems like a weird headcanon to me. However, I've always believed that the reason legendary Pokemon are considered legendary is because they're the last of their species and are unable to reproduce due to them being unable to breed with other Pokemon or even ditto. This makes a ton of sense because realistically, what makes a Pokemon legendary or mythical? More often than not, it's the rarity. They aren't widely available. I don't know, it's all really confusing. Here's Flamey Miss Me says, My headcanon is that the reason Tobias never returned is because he used illegal ways to get the legendaries and eventually the Pokemon League caught on to him, resulting in him getting lifelong jail time due to Pokemon cruelty. I prey on this man's downfall every day, so I approve of this headcanon. That good for nothing cheater deserves to be locked away. He's the kid on the playground who thought he was the shit for owning an action replay. The only action replay you're going to be seeing is the final kill cam of me blowing up your house. Dream Gamer says, I have an odd headcanon when it comes to the version exclusive gym leaders of Galar, more specifically Alistair and B. Though I did make this concept as more OC parallels being opposite gender twins when I first made it. It goes off the idea of each game being a different universe. Alistair in the Sword universe never got in the position to become the gym leader he is in the Shield universe. Instead, Alistair has a goal to befriend or catch all ghost types and possibly travel to different regions to obtain his goal. B has taken more of an interest in training herself in her fighting Pokemon and her fighting type Pokemon possibly to take on the gym challenge instead of being a gym leader herself or just to be an ultimate fighting type trainer. Training in isolated areas similar to the place she was training in her Twilight Wings episode. I've always wondered why this was a thing in the first place and I really like this explanation. I just wish they could coexist or something. It's kind of scary how in one universe you're extremely successful but in another you basically cease to exist. So come on, you exist right now. Make the most of it. All right, there's my motivational quote of the video. You're welcome, guys. Cole Ultima says, My headcanon is that Nanu's boss overworks Nanu to the point where Nanu is tired all the time and mostly never lets him go home. All I gotta say to this one is me too, Nanu. Me too. And I think that's a wrap. We covered a ton of headcanons in this video, and there's still so many more left to read. So if you guys do want a part four, let me know. Your cries and pleads were heard last time, so I'll be sure to deliver again. Leave your headcanons in the comments, like the video, subscribe, join the Discord, follow me. I think I'm forgetting something. Later. <laughs>